Professionals in the built environment have faced a particularly challenging year. The medium that we inhabit in the fields of architecture and planning is largely conceptual. We proceed through a domain of concepts and ideas, but the end result of our professional output is tangible, solid, and enduring. We aim to create spaces which are dependable, buildings that are reliable, and cities that are practical and easy to navigate. But this past year, our only constants have been adapt ad adaptability, unpredictability, and change. This is the Blur Building. The Blur Building was a media pavilion for the Swiss Expo in 2002, designed by Dilla, Scofidio, and Renfo. This was a building, but it wasn't. Just like Phil said, 2020 was a year which wasn't. The building was surrounded by walls which are vapour, an artificial cloud, but it has structure. It has piles and cantilevers and weather smart technology. In 2020, you all acquired knowledge, but you didn't come to classes. You have all been touched by the pandemic and by the response to it. Some of you have confronted illness and many others have confronted loss in various forms on innumerable facets of your lives. You have had to adapt to new ways of learning and whilst adapting to a new lifestyle and a new normal. Last year, we learned how vulnerable we all are and how much we can accomplish together. We've all been deeply challenged and we've also rediscovered our common humanity. And now it's up to you, the next cohorts of professionals to find a way forward. You are all here. You have made it and you've achieved. You've produced fantastic work, but you did so in isolation. On entering the blur, visual and acoustic references are erased. Contrary to immersive environments that strive for visual fidelity in high definition with ever greater technical virtuosity, blur was decidedly low definition. In this exposition pavilion, there was nothing to see but our dependence on vision itself. It's difficult to see the people around you. And now we have had to learn to come together in ways where we, where we remain separate. Some architects and planners have been looking to COVID to curb environmental impact, and others have been looking at COVID as providing new opportunities. The importance of adaptability has become increasingly evident during this pandemic. In the blur, where one can barely see, one adapts one other, the other senses. Individuals have had to adapt on a personal scale, as well as a sociological scale. We have had to adapt our buildings, our cities, our expectations, and our relationships. But adaptation is rarely just architects being architects and observing our surroundings. Our observations range from light switches to global transportation infrastructure, from face masks to deconstructed hospital cities. The profession is simultaneously intensely practical and completely theoretical. We now need to adapt cities, precincts and buildings to be safe and healthy and at the same time, not isolating. We have once again arrived at a juncture of disease and space, where fear of contamination controls what kind of spaces we want to be in. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a new type of building was established, where patients could be isolated and separated from the community. TB is a disease closely associated with the rapid growth of industrialization and overcrowded living conditions. 100 years later, we are once again confronted with a disease that spreads rapidly in dense living and working conditions. At the same time, research and the treatment of disease coincided with the advent of modernism. This was a cultural movement that in the planning of cities, architecture 
and applied design involved the integration of form with social purpose. It also attempted to create a new classless and hygienic lifestyle with socialist values. We pause now at this juncture between time, disease, economic inequality and rampant racism. It is here that planners and architects can and must use their skills in contributing to a society in a way that creates cities and spaces which are both healthy and just. Modernism was a cultural reaction to 19th century historicism. It resulted architecturally in a liberated expression of equality, which incorporated a practical economic design aesthetic with mass production as an essential factor. Distinctive architectural features, such as flat roofs, balconies, and terraces, were regarded, regarded as modernist through their association with the modern movement and international style buildings. But apart from popular architectural demands, flat roofs, balconies, and roof or garden terraces satisfied a desire to acquire a fashionable suntan in the unconducive Northern Hemisphere and reveal avant-garde architectural taste. Their other and less attractive purpose was for the treatment of pulmonary tuberculosis. Once again, the fear of contamin contamination controls what kinds of spaces we want to be in. Thus, as tuberculosis arguably shaped modernism, so COVID-19 and our collective experience of staying inside for months on end will influence the path of planners and architects in the immediate future. Where modern movement architecture was defined by crisp structures in spaces which are completely utilitarian, the Bleu, this 21st century building, was an experiment in de-emphasis on an environmental scale. It is a structure that simply intended to delight and maybe provoke its visitors. The Bleu is ethereal and misty. What a different space we are in now, where our understanding of the word aerosol is not mist or clouds, but the product of a cough or a sneeze laden with a dangerous virus. The blur is a building where water is the site and the primary building material. The designers wrote that the public can drink the building. It was a space without enclosure in which there are no fixed circulation spa spaces, no walls, no corridors, an architecture of total freedom. Hundreds of millions of people are confronting the realities of their own domestic spaces. From homes that are overcrowded and uncomfortable to open plan suburban homes without adequate partitions. The range of these domestic spaces is often not conducive to allowing multiple family members to learn, work, live, play and fight comfortably alongside one another. The pandemic has made the theoretical and philosophical immediate, not just to architects and planners, but to everyone stuck at home. Now that everyone on the planet must carefully weigh the benefits and dangers of crossing the threshold between private and public space, between indoors and outdoors, can we salvage anything of the old fantasy of public spaces? When the best hope for slowing and containing the spread of the virus is the careful regulation of movement and strict observance of social distancing, what happens to our desire for cities and buildings that celebrate wondering, promiscuous exploration and spontaneous social interaction. Will we ever be able to devote resources to help us congregate and to strengthen our frayed community bonds, be it through parks, plazas, promenades, community centres or streets turned over to pedestrians? These challenges are now yours. This is your playground to explore, your conundrum to ponder, your experiment to test. These intersections offer us some really unique opportunities and some true questions of accountability and ethics about what we build, what we have built and what we invest in the future. Architects, designers and planners around the world have had to reassess previous wisdoms once again 
and put their knowledge to use in the fight against COVID. Innovative solutions have surfaced that might stick around for a while. Some professionals are designing adaptations to homes and workspaces, while others are rethinking the city. COVID-19 has questioned both ideas about dense, socially diverse, democratically engaged cities at the same time as the way we inhabit buildings and move through spaces. Modernist principles of city design attempted to stave off the ill health of new megacities by creating spacious and, and democratic community settlements. Modernism was characterized by functionalism and airy egalitarian spaces. The advent of new technology became an inspiration and a driving force behind the buildings of European cities and social housing of the past century. At the time, the lack of sunlight, ventilation, and personal space were seen to be directly linked to the spread of disease. Le Corbusier's designs, along with those of his European counterparts, opened up a possibility of allowing working class families affordable, well-lit flats with balconies and green communal space to better handle respiratory illness. Writing in 1928, Le Corbusier stated, hygiene and moral health depend on the layout of cities. Without hygiene and moral health, the social cell becomes atrophied. With the progressive departure from the health concerns of the early 20th century and rapid urbanization, the knock-on effect of unmaintained housing estates, tiny living spaces and cramped corridors can be seen as one of the reasons why some urban developments from the 1960s onwards have been so effective in allowing the spread of COVID-19. As lockdowns stretch on in many places, we are only beginning to understand how COVID-19 will affect how we approach urban planning. Planned for properly, density has been a good thing for cities, and it will be again. But will we do more to protect, protect the most vulnerable? Will we make cities more resilient to future crises? Will we make our infrastructure more environmentally sustainable? And will we recognize the physical, economic, and social impact of disease on our cities? The decision around building future cities are yours to make. Moments of crisis provide opportunities for change. Changes in society are quickly reflected in the built environment, and times of reflection will shape architecture in the years that follow. The pandemic has been the most dramatic disruption to human activity in a generation. For many designers and planners, it has been a time to refocus and rethink how we design products, buildings and cities. The pandemic and restrictions on movement have changed the relationship of citizens to their streets, their public spaces and their public, public facilities. Clearly, public spaces must be a part of the response to the virus whether to limit the spread of the virus, spread out the population, or provide ways for people to relax and protest their, their, their rights. Hashem Sarkis, Dean of the MIT School of Architecture and Planning said, as architects, we are condemned to optimism. Our field is necessarily about proposing and imagining new things. What the world could be through making a part of it better, Sarkis also writes about how architecture traces contemporary fault lines of the profession today as it grapples with an accelerating pace of chaos and crisis, not just a pandemic, but social and economic inequality, entrenched racism and environmental collapse. Through COVID, some of us have looked for redemption through technical or scientific solutions. Others have posited anarchic, earthly, new utopias. But none of the professions have thought small. We have the ability to imagine solutions, to figure it out, to speculate a new way forward. Though this global crisis has been detrimental to the livelihoods of millions, some of the pandemic's impact on the environment has been positive. Sustainable buildings and cities will further consolidate its status as an integral part of every approach to every urban solution in the future.
a virus has given our planet a remedial lesson about how we are all connected. Architecture just may be the science that, con that can consolidate this terrible but liberating new wisdom. And to return to our collective education, what have we learned from this terrible pandemic? I think we've come to understand that there are more questions than answers, that we need to understand the value of flexibility and adaptability. And more than anything else, COVID has been a great leveler. It's a scary time to be launching a career. Today's graduates must be flexible and adaptable. There are jobs to be found, even if they're not the jobs that you had anticipated. You, the class of 2020, even despite all the challenges you are facing, and I acknowledge that there are many, you know how to make tomorrow work for you. Thank you.